inclusive framework, member countries announced reforms to restore some balance uh, to global taxing rights, including a move to a global minimum effective corporate tax rate of 15% for large multinationals with turnover exceeding 750 million euros. This minimum tax is something the fund has long supported. That agreement is part of the backdrop to our discussion on mining today. As far as Sub-Saharan Africa is concerned, many, including African Union leaders themselves, have noted the paradox that the region's mineral wealth exists side by side with widespread poverty. Uh, what explains this? A significant part of the answer is that we are seeing a pattern of international profit shifting by multinationals driven by differentials in corporate tax rates in producing countries relative to tax rates abroad. A recently published IMF departmental paper estimated that mining profits in sub-Saharan Africa are notably more vulnerable to profit shifting relative to other sectors of the economy. The paper also estimated a sizable fiscal cost to the region of tax avoidance in mining of between 450 and 730 million dollars per year in lost corporate tax revenue. Many sub-Saharan African countries have tax le legislation that is not sufficiently equipped to deal with these practices as they have evolved over time. The use of related party transactions is a key issue raised in the departmental paper, as is the pattern of inbound foreign direct investments, leaving resource intensive countries vulnerable to profits being booked abroad. Profits outside the region mean less revenue within it. The paper recommends strategies to address these risks and close loopholes, including through strengthening and simplifying transfer pricing regulations that apply to intra-company transactions in the mining sector and introducing effective rules to limit interest deductions. IMF researchers have observed that for those countries with interest limitation rules, the magnitude of international profit shifting is halved. There is also another part of the answer to why resource revenues have disappointed many. Project by project deal making on fiscal terms is common across Sub Saharan Africa. Competition for resource investments is spurring tax competition, particularly in the form of corporate tax rate cuts, exemptions, and tax holidays. As we all know, with this kind of competition, there are spillovers uh, to other countries that feel compelled to compete in the same way. But the result is that all countries lose. Fortunately, there is reason to be optimistic on these pressures for tax competition. With the recent inclusive framework announcement, our assessment is that the global minimum corporate tax should lessen pressures for tax competition. It's a reason to be optimistic that collective action can rise to meet the challenges we face. So it is uh, truly my pleasure, and I'm very pleased to introduce the panel today with experts who are all able to talk with great authority on these issues. First, joining me to provide a perspective from the region itself are Abore of Burkina Faso, who are at the front lines in witnessing the challenges, but who have also each had success in ensuring that more taxes from multinationals are paid locally. And second, uh, Tom, uh, Mr. Tom Butler, the former head of the International Council on Mining and Perspective on these issues, and uh, Professor uh, Leons uh, Ndikumana to share their perspectives and insights from the perspective of resource investors into the region and from civil society. A very warm welcome to our distinguished panelists and thank you very much for being part of this event. So let me now uh, kick off our uh, discussion by posing specific questions to our panelists. And I will begin 
uh, with the two ministers, uh, turning first to Minister Shimi, and um, saying that uh, I was recently, you know, uh, privileged to chair uh, another event discussing how we might uh, finance the sustainable development goals amidst the additional burden imposed by the pandemic um, and, uh, uh, the, of course, the deterioration in, in social indicators and, and poverty uh, that we've seen as a result of the pandemic. And of course, those domestic revenue are uh, domestic revenue mobilization is is critical is critical to the financing of the SDGs. So I wondered in this this context whether we might invite uh, you, Minister, first to comment uh, on the contribution that mining is making uh, to tax revenue mobilization in in uh, in Namibia, and uh, uh, give us a sense of what potential you see for it uh, doing better. Minister Shimi, please, the floor is yours. Uh, Minister, I I, you're mute. I was, I was, Minister. I was speaking to myself. Sorry about that. So I, I was just expressing my appreciation <laughs> for, for in, in, inviting me to this uh, very, very important discussion. Um, the timing of this discussion, I, I, I come and uh, emphasize um, the timeliness of this discussion because we are at a critical stage where we all need additional revenue because um, our economies have been devastated by the pandemic. Um, revenue has declined quite significantly and um, every little penny that we, additional penny we can get will, will be very, very helpful. So mining is a, it's a key sector in Namibia, um, not only um, in terms of its contribution to GDP, its contribution to exports, but also its contribution to, to government revenue. Um, it constitutes about 3% um, of GDP um, and, and about 10% of revenue. So that's, 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 that's quite significant. Um, and, and we believe Namibia is an outlier in that respect. I think that's when, when I, I, I look at, at, at other examples, that's more or less where, where others are. There are, of course, some outliers um, that, um, that have higher contributions in terms of revenue and GDP. Uh, but it also um, talks about the diversification of those economies. Um, so, but we still believe that there is, some, there is still some scope um, to collect additional revenue. Um, so we, we have to invest in um, strengthening our capacity. Um, as a tax administrator, we, we are now um, establishing an independent tax administration, and I can, and I can share some more light um, on that in a little while. That's one. So capacity building is very, very critical. Um, but also, we also need to strengthen our legislation because we uh, we believe we we have most of the good elements in in, in our legislation, but we we believe there's still some scope for further strength, strengthening of our legislation, especially when it comes to things like thin capitalization and things that you have talked about before, um, <clears throat> and also um, making sure that we implement our our transfer pricing uh, code. So um, let let me stop there and and, and allow my colleague to to come in unless you have additional questions that you may want to pose. Uh, no, Minister, that's very helpful already. I, I was just going to ask them whether, I, and you, you started speaking to it already in speaking to the issue of improvements in legislation and also uh, making sure that the implementation of your tri uh, transfer pricing regulations is, is fully adhered to. And I wondered in that context, whether you might, and this is of course on the, the side of the, the, the authorities, yourselves uh, that can do that uh, in, in, in terms of uh, your own contributions. And I, in my own experience, of course, when I was on the other side in your shoes <laughs> in Liberia, also uh, thinking through some of these issues around uh, trying to maximize the contribution of the mining sector, uh, there were significant challenges internally as well in terms of sometimes, of course, uh, making sure uh, that the sector ministers uh, in question and the Minister of Finance, we're working, Ministry of Finance, we're working uh, uh, in, in parallel, in parallel uh, as a team and uh, not pursuing different objectives sometimes. And that the Minister of Finance was indeed always present and the lead on issues around uh, uh, the revenues we expect from the mining sector. Are there any challenges remaining around that in, in Namibia that you might uh, comment on? Yeah, I, 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 I believe um, what is important is really proper consultations. Um, so far, we believe we have 
we have very good support from our from our counterparts in in the in the mining sector. Um, obviously, as the the reforms take take shape, um, we we expect to get some resistance, especially from the from the mining sector itself, because you know mining sector is always so anybody's anybody's immune to pay tax because they want to maximize their income. Um, and, 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 and sometimes they also convince the sector ministries that, uh, that you know, um, if, if, you, if you charge them too much tax, it's going to destroy the industry. Uh, but so far, we have not um, picked up any, any, any resistance from, uh, from our counterpart in the mining sector. The cooperation is, is, is it's, um, it's quite, quite strong, and, uh, and, and we, we appreciate that. No, thank you so much, uh, Minister. Thank you for uh, those comments. So let, let me now invite uh, Minister Kabore uh, to also uh, come in and, and speak to us, give us your perspective on, you know, uh, the, the contribution of the mining, mining sector to tax revenue mobilization in Burkina, uh, uh, the challenges you might uh, uh, be encountering uh, in, in, in maximizing that contribution um, Minister, please, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Ms. Saye, dear fellow ministers of finance and other participants, indeed, this panel discussion is extremely important to discuss a, a crucial sector to our country. In Burkina Faso, the contribution of the mining sector is great, namely in capital formation. The contribution to GDP is 7% in the secondary sector if you take the gdp this sector accounts for not 29 percent with the mining sector being the main player in this contribution to the gdp when you look at the revenue in recording in, in 2020 no, so it accounts for 15% of our own revenue in 2020, with, of course, a production of about 62 tons of gold. Obviously, you can easily understand, as my colleague from Namibia said, the mining companies are trying to optimize their revenue, their, their profits, and their, there is a policy of tax optimize, optimization. In Burkina Faso, unfortunately, we have two types of texts. In 2003, to attract investors, we adopted favorable legislation in the whole YMU area where the tax rate was low. In 2015, with the support of the IMF and the World Bank, we developed tax that were further reducing tax exemptions. This 2015 tax reduced, uh, increased, the corporate income tax rate. But now that creates a problem. What we see in the mining sector, the former treaties are applicable, but there are new mines in operation. So we see that we have the treaties on the one hand, but it was very difficult to make a distinction between the amount produced and that of the former mine that is taxed 70% and the other much higher. That's why we try to work with AfriTAC and to help our teams to 
better address this situation. We've also seen some mergers where, of course, this involve countries outside of Burkina Faso. So this is not um, an easy situation. Now, in terms of capital, we have about $10 million that is a very low amount compared to the real investments made. So we see this as a financial burden. She invests more than $400 million, but the rest is financial burdens. And if we see in terms of the payment of these financial burdens, it comes at a very high cost. And this is due to tax optimization. And that is why we have to work to increase revenue. And that has led us to adopt some legislation, the mining code and a lately legislation on local content, because the minings import almost everything, including food and meat. And we need to develop that sector as well. And as my colleague said, we work with all the mines. We have a very fruitful uh, dialogue. We've consulted with them because they are aware that civil society, including the government, do not longer accept what is the status quo. And this will help us to improve the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. It is indeed very important what you're saying. And let me switch back to English. <laughs> it will be easier for me. To already start to focus on uh, these challenges of, uh, you, you stress the, uh, the challenges in, in, in dealing, of course, with uh, two different pieces of legislation that you had initially uh, that could be, um, shall we say, maybe, uh, you know, uh, enabling of, of practices then that uh, led to a reduction in your, your own intake from, from these different investments in mining in, 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 uh, in Burkina. Uh, but the efforts you're making now uh, in, in dialogue, of course, with the private sector and a very, uh, 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 you know, good dialogue apparently in Burkina that has allowed you to already start thinking about how to, how to change those things and, and uh, make improvements there, which is very good news. But you've really uh, given us some uh, very good illustrations of, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges of different, uh, 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 you know, uh, tax rates in the, in the two different pieces of legislation, corporate tax, income tax rates, and of course, uh, uh, how, how, how companies uh, can, can work to maximize uh, their profits from that. Uh, very good. And this is, um, with that dialogue that is ongoing, actually, between the private sector and yourselves, it's a good way to turn to Mr. Tom Butler uh, to get his uh, comment on, on um, you know, from the perspective, of course, of uh, the mining and business sector more generally, um, what he observes about the importance of mining to the region and its role really in financing uh, development needs in the region, uh, what, uh, what changes can be uh, beneficial to country authorities and still uh, uh, recognizing the importance of, of course, investments, making a return on investments for, for investors. So, uh, Mr. Butler, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Antoine. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be on this panel. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's, it's wonderful, actually, to hear both ministers referring to the ongoing consultation and dialogue uh, with the industry, which I think is essential. Um, in terms of the, 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 the contribution to, to Africa, I think mining is very important. Your report highlights some of the numbers. So the resource-rich countries, on average, 10% uh, of GDP contribution, 50% of exports, 31% of foreign direct investment, and 8% 8, 8 of domestic revenue. So we're talking very significant um, uh, economic impacts. And the cash, cash flows for mining, when they're wisely spent, can help. 
the best known example in the developing world is uh, is is outside Africa, or Chile, where they took a very strategic approach to diversification and have been very successful in diversifying their economy. And I think in, in Africa, the example that is always cited is uh, Botswana, although in deference to the two ministers on the, on the call, I think they're, they're doing a, a good job as well. Mining brings other con uh, contributions, both economic and also to social capital. And the, the minister for Burkina Faso referred to procurement, which is uh, very significant. If you can um, maximize your local procurement, you can really have a significant uh, impact in the supply chain. And one of the reasons that uh, uh, countries, particularly in Africa, welcome mines is because of the job creation. The, the, um, the mining industry is capital intensive and doesn't generate many direct jobs, but the indirect job multiplier can be very significant if you get procurement right. I've seen multiples of up to 25 to 1, and that's through local procurement efforts, transfer of skills and capacity building of um, uh, SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. And the other, the other big... Um, uh, opportunity is the potential to, to anchor infrastructure, which can be used by other mining companies or indeed other sectors. And I think we still need to work a bit more at that. There are some good examples around Africa, but um, I'm talking about things like bridges, uh, ports for logistics and, um, and power supply, where, um, you know, a, a big mine could anchor, a, for example, a power plant that could also serve the community and other sectors. I think I think also that the one one point I'd like to make is that we need to, uh, whilst we keep um, focusing on these aspects, we also, from the industry's perspective, need to um, focus on diversifying the tax base. And um, just to put the the numbers into perspective, we're talking here about um, the report highlights um, missed opportunity of between four hundred and seven hundred million dollars across the continent. The, the top 10 countries, according to the EITI declarations, receive on average about $4 billion in tax from the, um, the mining industry. And uh, I looked at the tax, the country by country tax reports of the top two companies operating in Africa, which is Anglo American and Glencore, and they uh, together contribute about $2.8 billion dollars a year in tax, um, you know, which, which they're declaring on a country by country basis. So we're talking, you know, just just uh, compared to those numbers, we're talking about um, between 10 and 15 percent of of the amounts that are actually being received. And I'm not um, I'm not seeking to minimize the importance of the number. I think, you know, 700 billion dollars is a very big number. Um, and I'm sure that much can be done to um, to reduce that. Um, but I do think we're into the, what, what I call the 80-20 rule. You know, when you build a house, 20% uh, of the, the effort gets you to 80% of the house. And the last 80% of the effort is required to finish the, 20, the remaining 20% of the house. And, um, and you know, in, in terms of the effort uh, that, that needs to be uh, put into securing that last sort of uh, 15 or 10% or, or, or of taxes, it could be very significant compared to, um, you know, where, what we've uh, already achieved. And you mentioned, Antoinette, the, the global minimum tax. Most of, uh, most of the mining companies are paying effective tax right, rates well above 15%, um, but I'm looking forward to um, seeing some of the digital companies uh, paying their fair share in, in Africa. Um, the top three digital companies um, uh, are estimated by ActionAid to, um, to be not paying something like uh, $2.8 billion to the Global South. And I'm hoping that that global minimum tax will, will bring some of that in. So in conclusion, just uh, in terms of my opening comments, um, I think, uh, I think uh, you know, the mining industry does make very significant contributions, not just financial, but well beyond that. We need to keep that in mind. And um, finance ministers and, and governments obviously have to make choices in terms of the allocation of effort, in terms of, of tax gathering, and much more can be done, I think, in, in terms of you know, the, the opportunities highlighted by the report, actually, and we've heard about thin capitalization already and, and um, uh, uh, you know, interest rates charged on arm's length deals. Um, but there also needs to be a balance kept in mind in terms of growing the pie, encouraging more investment, and also diversifying the tax base, which is which is a big concern for the industry. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Butler, for for those very uh, very important points. And uh, absolutely, uh, messages uh, that uh, I think uh, we, we've all uh, sought to uh, to pass and to to uh, to make sure uh, you know. Uh, uh, 
authorities and country authorities are also paying attention to issues around, uh, you know, diversifying the tax base, as you say, and pursuing uh, other uh, uh, avenues for, for, not, for raising revenue, and that's uh, certainly the case. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it is still important, of course, obviously, uh, to, to continue, given, given uh, what they already have in hand, to make sure that uh, they minimize and they, they, they reduce the leakages uh, from this source that is already in place. And that is the perspective, of course, uh, of this uh, conversation, focusing, focusing so much on, on this. Uh, but you're absolutely right about, about the potential contribution of uh, the mining sector. Uh, to the economy at large, uh, 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 beyond uh, the specifics of its own uh, uh, investments in the mining sector, but the spillover effects of that investment to the rest of the economy, if there are procurement opportunities that are uh, maximized for local uh, procurement, the linkages to the domestic economy, uh, that um, uh, there can be uh, better improvements in that regard. No question about that. And they direct jobs, of course, that come from that. Um, so uh, very, very important points. Uh, but I wondered whether we might even spend another minute with you on, uh, on the mining revenue itself, whether uh, you see at, uh, you know, clear areas of improvement uh, that we, we might, uh, uh, that might uh, you know, be a, joint, uh, a jointly and satisfactorily uh, pursued uh, uh, by the mining sector in partnership with the government. Well, I think I think the report has highlighted a number of recommendations, and I, I you know, I know that um, many countries across Africa have have already addressed the the thin capitalization rule. Uh, I I think the um, you know the other opportunity is 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 as the minister for Namibia pointed out, uh, capacity building to uh, to deal effectively with um, with arms length arrangements um, because. You know, I've, I've experienced this myself in my previous life. I, I worked in IFC where, you know, I was working with a private sector company that, that wanted to, to charge 14% uh, interest rate on shareholder loans. And, and you know, as, as an uh, employee of IFC, I was able to say that that was unacceptable. But that we then went looking for a benchmark. And in, in, you know, in some countries in Africa, it's very hard to find a, a benchmark for, for what would be an acceptable arm's length rate. And, and I think I think the IMF can support that. You know, uh, I think additional data, uh, you know, provision of comparables, um, you're bringing across data from other countries can can help, and all of that can support capacity building. And you know, the other the other um, issue which I think mining companies are concerned about is that um, you know this is a very sort of um, subjective issue. Everyone can reach a different opinion. I mean, they're all trying to. Do it right and be responsible, but you can still have two people who legitimately disagree on, you know, what is an acceptable arm's length rate for a shareholder loan, for example. And I think, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that can be done or could be better done to address that would be to, uh, you know, reach agreements ex ante so that you don't end up in a sort of two-year dispute with with a country, uh, which is very bad for the, the the reputation of the country and potentially the company as well, um, and uh, becomes a distraction. So those would be my my you know my sort of what I would pick from the from the various different recommendations that you've made in the report report as the priorities. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Butler. Um, in fact, you've you've responded to a question I was going to ask uh, subsequently, and uh, it is absolutely the case that uh, you know capacity, of course, uh, is is critical here as uh, Minister Shimi also underscored and uh, a role for the fund in helping with, with uh, uh, some aspects of capacity uh, uh, building in, in this regard. And data, as you say, is an important uh, piece of it. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, making sure that uh, data on these uh, uh, questions are available uh, across. Um, so thank you very much for those comments. Let's, let's turn to uh, Professor Ndekumana and ask him, uh, to give his perspective on uh, what, from the perspective of uh, your your work, and uh, you have been uh, uh, deeply engaged, uh, professor, uh, and and well well recognized over the years for your work on uh, uh, illicit uh, uh, financial uh, flows and and issues around that. Uh, but in the context of the mining sector, in particular, to tell us uh, 
uh, your perspective on the importance of the that, uh, the sector to uh, uh, to development uh, in the region and its um, its role in in financing uh, a very large uh, development needs. What can be done to to maximize its contribution to that, Professor? Floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, depending on where you are situated, um, I want to first of all. Uh, uh, express my appreciation for to the IMF for uh, inviting me as a representative of uh, the international, uh, the Independent uh, Commission for Reform of uh, International uh, Corporate Taxation, ICRICT. Um, I think this is a, a very welcome uh, event. I first of all want to commend the IMF for. Uh, engaging this debate for driving this research on um, taxation of mining. Uh, I think the, um, the IMF being in the, in, the, in the leadership of this process is very, very important for several reasons. One, uh, many have already been mentioned, but one which is very important is that they can help spread the information about best practices that are emerging on the continent. Because when I look at the evidence, I see too a lot of diversity in the in the fiscal regimes that countries are using, and I wonder whether actually countries know what the neighbors are doing because there are countries that are doing very very good things, and I'm wondering why other countries don't uh, don't apply it. But to, to to start with, I want to put the, the discussion in the in the context of um, a continent that's still struggling to to achieve and maintain high growth rate, a continent that's still lagging in terms of uh, of poverty reduction. And a, a continent that's be, that's even before the, before the COVID pandemic, and a continent that has been hit uh, and is going to be uh, experiencing severe consequences of the of the COVID pandemic. And it is uh, even the, even if in advanced countries we see recovery, I think Africa is going to lag to, to lag behind. So resource mobilization is very 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 important. At the same time, I see a lot of paradoxes and and. Uh, and ironies, in the sense that when I look at the evidence again, uh, lo long uh, from a, from a, from a long time, I don't think that mining mining rich mineral rich countries have done any better than uh, the non rich countries. So that's that's a fact. I don't think mineral resource resource rich countries have leveraged their wealth to grow faster, to do to do better in terms of poverty reduction, to do better in terms of social development. That's one thing. Uh, the other is that um, in terms of revenue, they are, they are underperforming. And in fact, you, you just you remember that uh, Zambia was the first country to, de to, to, to declare default, their default during the COVID. This is one of the most rich countries in terms of uh, mineral resources. It shows clearly that they are not generating the benefits uh, that they, they deserve. From, from from minerals. The other issue which has was touched on uh, by, by Tom is the, the lack of, uh, of diversification. So these countries have not leveraged their mineral resources to, to boost investment in other sectors. They have not done much in terms of uh, uh, adding value. The value chain development has not, has not started yet. Um, there, is a big, big, there are beginnings in the, in, in, in the case of, of uh, of Botswana, for example, with their deals with the beers, I think this that, that's a good way that's a good way to proceed. A very limited links between mineral resource mineral sector and uh, and the other the parts of the economy. So uh, spillover effects are very limited. Um, uh, so the, and also uh, the mineral resources sector remains like an island in the economy. It's not linked to financial sector. Um, the capital comes from, from the rest of the world, from abroad, and profits are repatriated. So there is not really any, any, uh, any uh, benefits to the, to the financial sector in terms of the, res the resource intermediation. Um, but there are encouraging reforms. So uh, globally, first of all, um, this discussion comes at the, at the a week after the G20 in Rome, in those that two pillar solution to the challenges of Arising from 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 uh, digitation for for uh, tax tax mobilization, and the pillar two introduces the, the fifteen uh, minimum tax rate for MNEs. 
it's disappointing that they that they did not approve the U.S. Uh, proposed uh, rate of 21 percent. It's even more disappointing that they did not approve uh, go with our proposal, ICRIC proposal of 25 percent minimum tax because 15 percent is very is still very low. Um, of course, it's better than when uh, than what existed in in some some countries. But we hope that this is the beginning. Of a, of, a, of a process where these rates are going to be to be revised again, because African countries have seen their fiscal spaces um, severely under stressed because of the of the COVID pandemic uh, uh, mitigation measures, and the, the threat, the concern now we have is that with the limited uh, uh, fiscal space, countries are, go are going to see further accumulation of public debt which was already a concern uh, during during the before before the before covid so um i think what needs to be done is first of all at the global level we need a process that is that is truly truly inclusive okay so for example there are advances that have been made in terms of country by country reporting where governments get access to, to information of, of M&E payments uh, by country by countries, but that's not, still, that's not yet benefiting to African countries. I think the, the bilateral agreements between countries and, 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 and corporations, it doesn't help because these corporations are very, very powerful. They are economically bigger than many, many economies in Africa. So it's hard for African governments to negotiate themselves or in isolation with these memories. And that's why I would think that a, co a coordinated effort by governments in Africa through the, uh, by, with the help of the, the AU, the African Union, the IMF, the World Bank, will be more helpful so that they can leverage the, the advances already made by developed countries in negotiating with MNEs, rather than having individual countries go head to head with, uh, with uh, with, with, with the MNEs. Um, I think the other thing is, as I said, I think I would, help, I would like to see uh, IMF helping African gov gov countries to learn al already from, them, from each other. So for example, um, that some countries have already done some uh, uh, changes in, the, in, their, in their fiscal regimes to limit the negotiation mind by mind. I think negotiation by mind by mind, by mind is a bad idea. I think that should be removed. Sierra Leone has already, already remo removed that. I see that some countries have already set limits to interest deductions, South Africa and Nigeria. Why don't other countries do that? Um, uh, rent sharing arrangements are, are, are improving in terms of Botswana. They, are now, they have now 15% stake in the DBS. Why doesn't Zambia negotiate those kinds of deals with, with, uh, with, with, with copper mining companies? Capacity building, technical assistance, Thank you again to the global corporate, the global community for assisting Zambia to negotiate and and get money its money back from from Opani. If they have done it by themselves, I'm not sure whether they, they would have been able to, to to get it. So again, this is an area where, for example, IMF can be a good a good player, a big player in in, in building capacity. What should uh, MNEs do? Do what they have mandated to do, which is be transparent. First of all, disclose your contract, disclose your payments globally on a country by country basis. We are the, the countries in Africa are not asking MNEs to be to be any to be benevolent uh, social social players. We are asking them to them to be to be private enterprises, but pay their dues. They should pay their royalties as mandated by in the registration. They should pay the corporate taxes as mandated by the registration. And they should do, they should do pay taxes and, 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 and duties on their goods and, and trade as everybody else does. So the other thing is that whatever uh, countries can do in terms of joint ventures be, between governments and MNEs would be much appreciated. The other is, Building domestic capacity to negotiate with MNEs. Again, here IMF would be would be very helpful in that in that venture. I'm going to stop here and then wait for other 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 questions. Thank you very much.
No, thank you so much, uh, Professor Enrikuman. Uh, uh, very, very helpful, all of, all of the points uh, uh, you've made. And uh, certainly, uh, we all see, uh, I think, uh, uh, a, a role for better uh, support to peer learning, as you, as you underscored, uh, a, a very important area of learning from each other that sub-Saharan African countries can, can do. As you say, some countries are indeed, including the two uh, represented here with us today, uh, doing very, very uh, good uh, things and, and seeking to, to move ahead on this uh, challenging uh, uh, you know, task of, of trying to maximize the contribution of uh, mining to their uh, revenue mobilization and that they can share uh, practices they can share uh, with others and uh, uh, you know trying to do more of that and support more of that is certainly uh, an area of uh, a significant interest for the for the fund in terms of the the capacity development support that we uh, that we can provide um, uh, you know, uh, you've raised of course the issues of uh, uh, as, as others have the issues of diversification of and uh, this this tends to be an issue that is only focused on when of course uh, commodity prices are low. <laughs> and uh, not sustained enough uh, throughout. And of course, progress on diversification needs a long-term perspective and long-term effort uh, that uh, we very much uh, see the need to really uh, uh, support uh, countries in really pursuing that effort over a long, longer period of time. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the disappointing uh, nature from your perspective of, <laughs> of the, uh, the, the, the minimum tax, uh, the, the international corporate minimum tax that uh, could have been higher. Um, it, it, is a, it is a very good start, though. I think we can all agree uh, to have this uh, a minimum tax that uh, has a great potential in reducing uh, competition, tax competition. Um, uh, you know, by itself, of course, uh, this minimum tax will not uh, do it all. We, we still need all of the other uh, efforts that uh, you have uh, emphasized on the capacity development side, for sure, that countries really uh, reinforce their capacity uh, to, to actually know uh, uh, the nature of uh, their, uh, their tax base in the mining sector and how to, to make sure that they're getting the most they can from it. Uh, but thank you very much for that contribution. I think it's a good way also of turning uh, back to the ministers to talk uh, about uh, the issue of, um, you know, the challenges they see actually uh, in the, around the international profit shifting which of course uh, we we expect uh, uh, hopefully that this um, minimum tax will help uh, uh, with some of the challenges around that, but not with all of them. And so uh, to intervene and speaking uh, in relation to international profit shift, shifting and what steps you have take, taken to strengthen safeguards uh, against uh, against that. Uh, what, what do you have seen as most effective in, in um, addressing this issue? Minister Shimi, please. Thank you very much. And um, I, I, I believe what I said earlier on, it's, it's probably our biggest challenge. Our biggest challenge is really capacity because as, um, as Professor Dikumana um, has mentioned, yeah, the, the, the mining companies are highly sophisticated. They have they have got all the skills that they need to, um, you know, do tax planning um, to avoid as much tax as possible. So the, the the biggest challenge is to attract people with similar skills who who will be in a position to understand the operations of these mining mining companies. From our end, what we're trying to do now is really to try and, and, and strengthen the tax administration capacity. Um, it, 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 we are still in the starting phase of establishing our independent revenue office. It was, so, it was only uh, established in April this year. Um, probably for the next two years or so, much of the focus will really try and, 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 and get that going and, and make sure that our tax administration is, pro, is better organized. So, and and, and uh, we are also able to attract um, people with the necessary skills because that's really the idea. The idea is that um, if we don't have people with, um, with the requisite skills to be able to understand these complex transactions, it, it, it's going to be difficult to get an extra, extra revenue from the, from the uh, mining sector and, and other multinationals. Um, so that's, 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 that's one challenge. The other challenge of, um, that we see from our side is, um, is the tax treaties. Um, in the case of Namibia, we have about 11 of them. 
and they're very, very old. They were negotiated early, early days. Um, and they were negotiated when, you know, for instance, when the depth of uh, framework was not was not in place. Now the fact that we we are party to a number of um, conventions, um, the multilateral conventions, for for instance, in, on tax treaty that we signed this year, um, it, I think it's going to help to be help helpful to you know introduce some of those principles that are in those in those conventions in 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 our in in our uh, tax treaties going forward. So the idea is really to renegotiate that. Um, and to get you know our, our partner countries to the to the negotiating table, I think that's going to be a challenge. But that's something that we have that we have to do. So the other part is is also trying to uh, review our tax code. Um, at the moment, we um, we do not have a specific limit on interest, um, but we have something similar on the exchange control side. Um, the because we still have some exchange control. So if you are you are borrowing if 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 you are borrowing from your, you know, no mother company out, out out there. So what what would be the limit? So there is some limit from from that end. But I think it's important to strengthen our tax code to put that a, a similar provision in the, in in our tax code um, so that it's, it's also transparent from a, from a tax perspective. So those are the, the challenges that we are um, that we are experiencing. The other challenge is that we are also that that we are also experiencing which is of our own design and it's still a, de a debate that we have among ourselves is the deductions that we have you know in, in terms of um, you know investment incentives for instance if you set up a mine or if, if you come to namibia and explore um, your exploration expenditure it's written off um year one when you start when you start production um of course that creates a lot of big Tax losses and, and that are carried forward, and for 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 a long period of time, mines do not pay tax. So we 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 will have to review that to see whether it's still it's still the efficient way of um of, of collecting tax or, or incentivizing um the, the mining sector. And 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 also we also have some other deductions that we will have to review. So maybe they are they are still appropriate, but that's some that's something that we have to review. Um, so while I'm there, I think there was a question about diversification, um, which is important. I think um, if anything, um, the mining sector, will, what we have learned is that the mining sector will give you revenue, um, but it doesn't necessarily give you jobs, especially in the case of Namibia. Um, um, so mining is very capital in intensive, especially diamond mining for, for us is very capital intensive because it's actually now offshore. Um, you have a big vessel with three people, you can get a lot of diamonds from the sea. So you, you, you get revenue, but you aren't getting your jobs. But it, it's, it's typical to the, to, to the mining sector. It, 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 it creates revenue, but doesn't create jobs. So when we talk about diversification, we, we have to, to look elsewhere, not, not, not only in, in, in terms of, I think what, what, what we have also learned is that the backward and forward linkages between mining and, and the rest of the economy, it, it's, very, it's very weak. Uh, because if, if you look in the product space, Mining is very isolated from the rest of, 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 of other products you can produce. Because we are, we are also learning that you diversify by actually building on the know-how that you have. You are, you, you are building on, you are, you are asking yourself, what is the next product that I can produce based on the know-how that I have? Yeah, and now mining being very far from the product space, it, 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 the, the jump that you have to jump from there to the next product is very, very difficult. So and 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 that's why in many countries that are, are mining intensive, it's difficult to to see um, countries actually developing further in the value chain of mining. Um, so and, and 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 what we have seen is that countries don't diversify, especially by actually moving forward, moving forward down for, down further in in the in the value chain of, chain of mining. So uh, it's interesting. The, um, the debate that we are having here, but that's that's more or less the, the, the experience we have picked up. So we're now looking at other areas of um, of industries where we believe that we can build on the existing know-how and, and diversify. Let me let me stop there. And uh, if you have some follow-up questions, I will I will answer those questions. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, uh, very helpful. Uh, all of all of those uh, points uh, made um, uh, a lot to comment on. But uh, since we're running out of time, I'm just going to pass on to others to to intervene and, and uh, to invite Minister Kabore uh, to say from the perspective from from what you've heard from Minister Shimi, how does that compare to uh, the the situation in in Burkina in dealing with uh, issues around profit shifting? 
Um, Thank you very much. Well, indeed, what Minister Shimi said is um, similar in our country. And also what uh, Professor Dikumana said, we have to improve diversification. And that's why I mentioned the issue of local content. We have to encourage mining companies to use solar power. In Burkina Faso, we have a lot of solar potential and uh, they can uh, use that and implement that in our national grid and that can benefit the population. And of course, um, add further value. We will also work with them on the supply chain What's happening now is that they don't create a lot of jobs, but if we create lots of activities around them, subcontractors in the food industry or other areas, that will generate further income. And that's why we need to engage the minds in our discussion, and they are in agreement in terms of uh, pricing the transfer pricing, 15% you mentioned for the minimum tax. Well, in Burkina Faso, this 15% will already help us to combat tax competition among the states. So this is already a good starting point. And when we mentioned a certain number of convention with the OECD and the tax treaties and mutual assistance. We have so many conventions that we did sign and this aims to minimize uh, losses in terms of transfer pricing. So we need to work and uh, consolidate these efforts and capacity building is extremely important. As Minister Shimi said, our tax administrations are weak. They don't have the capacity to better understand the accounting of some of the companies where there are often loans among subsidiaries of the same company. That's why in Burkina Faso, we have a specialized unit in place. And we've asked the IMF to help us and uh, train these uh, officers, especially be specialized in mining to monitor better the situation and establish a dialogue in order to have a better larger impact on the population as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. Of course, uh, again, underscored the importance of uh, capacity and skills and uh, the need to really uh, reinforce those uh, as a way of consolidating the efforts that you've already made and taking them a, a step further. Further, of course, and um, uh, uh, quite a bit of work uh, to do there uh, uh, in partnership with not, not just the IMF, of course, but with uh, others who have expertise in areas, for example, in re reinforcing the negotiation capacity of, of, uh, of countries, uh, uh, areas that the fund may not uh, have expertise in. Uh, that, that's certainly uh, an important one. And speaking of negotiations, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, come back to Professor um, Indikumana, actually, on a point he, uh, he was making, uh, and I think others uh, would agree, to uh, the importance of moving away from mine by mine uh, negotiations, um, uh, which is not best practice uh, <laughs> and, and can create uh, quite a, a, a history, a legacy of problems uh, to, to a better, mm -hmm. uh, better way of reflecting you know, tax provisions, of course, fully in the tax code itself rather than in these individual agreements. And, but there are challenges, obviously, around the, the fiscal stabilization that you find in these uh, project by project agreements that limit the abilities 
of countries sometimes to, to uh, renegotiate them and to move uh, provisions uh, more properly to the tax code and, uh, and, and, and follow uh, best practices in that connection. And I wondered, uh, you know, what you would say about those challenges and how countries uh, work to, uh, uh, to, to try to address those from your perspective. Uh, thank you very much. I think um, generally what what I see as a, as an issue is is that um, the kinds of um, isolated negotiations by 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 MNEs between MNEs and, and governments basically undermines the fiscal system generally in the country, and this opens opens up for big opportunities for rent sharing, rent seeking by, by, by MNEs, but also corruption. Because if the rules are so different across minds, how are you going to determine whether somebody's behave, behaving uh, uh, legally or illegally? Because, um, and the other thing is that then it makes, it, it weakens the position of the government. Because if a new mine, if a new uh, company comes, they have learned that this mine has a 20 year holiday Tax holiday on the, on similar operations, you cannot go. You know, you cannot impose taxes on them because they're going to claim that you are you are becoming you are becoming unfair. Because one of the things that uh, African government need to understand is that they actually do not need to work so hard to attract to attract uh, capital in mining. The idea that you have to sell your house. For the, for the mining corporations to come and do mining in your country is simply not supported by the evidence because surveys show over and over again that fis fiscal, f fiscality is not the top constraint to, to investment in mining. It is not. And yet countries are go, go ahead and, and give multi-year uh, uh, agreements that are not renegotiated. And to, to be, be basically, the problem is that those deals have to be done. Those arrangements have, have to be cognizant of the fact that the future is not known, OK? Nobody knows when, when what, what, what will happen to the price of copper, what will happen to the price of diamonds. So why are you going to sell your resources over 20 years when you don't know the, the, the benefits from, from those resources? If all countries be, begin to, to behave the same way, the companies are not going to run anywhere because right now they game countries over, over the other because they are not, the, the African countries are not to speaking to each other. If African countries were speaking to each other, it would be possible to get better deals because you, you remove the, 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 the possibility for, for speculation by, 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 by um, by multinational corporations. The other point I want to, co to come across again in, one, in 30 seconds is that I spoke about transparency on the part of MNEs. There is also a need for increased transparencies on the part of governments so that the public knows what is being done in the mining sector, what contracts are being, are being signed, how much production, how much, how much trade. Third, second, there is a need to improve access to, to statistics. Uh, on, on, on mining. When I look at, when I do my, my research, I find that for the same uh, uh, product, you find different values in the Ministry of Mining, in the Central Bank, in customs, and then in the UN statistics. And I'm thinking, what's happening? So we need, it, it, it's important for African countries to be able to, to better track the operation in the mining sector in terms of production, exports and so on. You're not going to be able to, 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 to tax a company if you don't even know how much they are producing, if you don't know how, how much they are, they are exporting. The other, we have, we have talked about, um, about tax revenue. The other side of it is foreign exchange revenue. Countries are being robbed by, by manipulation of the, of, 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 of the invoices by companies, by, with intra-company trading, where Mopani dealing with, with Glencore end up shifting not just tax, uh, the tax base, but also uh, shifting the, the, the foreign exchange revenue so that countries are not recouping all they, need, they, they deserve in terms of foreign exchange from exports because of this, uh, this uh, uh, tax planning and also uh, uh, non-transparent transactions. 
So we need to invest in better statistical systems in African countries. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, we, we're running out of time, so I'm going to turn immediately to uh, Mr. Butler uh, to give his perspective on, on this issue of project-by-project uh, -by -project resource contracts that the, the paper, the, the, the departmental paper we're discussing certainly highlighted the prevalence of that and uh, you know, the, 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 the issues that, uh, the difficulties and, and problems that that poses for uh, countries in, in the region, um, and a driver of regional tax competition as well in the, the uh, use of tax incentives. And of course, it's not illegal to, to, uh, to try to get incentives, but as Professor Indikumana just said, uh, that is, uh, on, uh, in terms of uh, the evidence uh, uh, over time, we know that incentives have not been the basis of attracting the reason uh, for that the investments actually go to one country or another. Uh, but from your perspective, well, you know, are these uh, incentives uh, indeed e eroding uh, revenue mobilization in the region? Are there things that the business community could do to limit the losses uh, that countries have from these incentives? And that will be uh, our last mentioned before, unfortunately, this fascinating conversation will have to bring to a, a close. But Mr. Butler, please go ahead. We're running over, but please go ahead. All right. Well, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. And um, I, uh, I'm i sorry not to inject controversy into the, the session, but I, I do actually agree with Professor Ndikumano on this point. I, I think that uh, contract by contract um, negotiations are, are very bad. Mining companies, at least the more sophisticated companies, have understood this for some time uh, it, because it, it, it injects risk into the process. You know, it's it's um, there's a risk that you get a subsequent government which says, well, there's been corruption here. This is a sweet deal. We're going to turn this over. And nobody likes that. So, uh, you know, mining companies would far rather you know, come along and see a, a, a mining code that specifies everything and that leaves nothing to discretion uh, because that reduces the risk. And, you know, what, what they and I also agree, by the way, uh, with his point that, that this is not the determining factor. So in terms of the race to the bottom, the determining factor in terms of how you assess a country is its track record for policy making, for decision making, for how it engages with the mining sector. So that's why I started off right at the beginning saying how welcome it was uh, to me to hear that both uh, Namibia and Burkina Faso you know, have got good engagement and consultation with the sector, because that's what the sector wants as well. Now, I know you're out of time, but if I can just take 30 seconds to to, to you know, make, make uh, two or three points about uh, what I've heard that the IMF can do here. First of all, you know, we, we've heard about the provision of information and benchmarks so that you know, one country knows what the next one's doing and, and you know, to address issues like um, arm's length uh, deals. The second one was regional coordination more generally, you know, trying to avoid this race to the bottom, which I agree is, is ultimately very unhealthy for Africa. And then the third one, support for capacity and Maybe the IMF doesn't have the expertise, but perhaps the funds to support, uh, you know, well-informed uh, legal teams, negotiation teams where it's necessary. And then last but not least, uh, uh, fostering these kind of debates, because I think, you know, the more uh, you hold these kind of discussions, the healthier um, uh, the, the situation will be and the better understanding will, will, there will be on both sides between private sector, civil society and government. So. Thank you very much, and uh, I much, much uh, enjoyed the conversation. Uh, likewise, Mr. Butler, uh, and a very good, almost a summary of our discussion in a way, uh, spelling out the areas of uh, significant consensus, I think, uh, in, in, our, in our panel on, on uh, a number of uh, the issues around this uh, difficult uh, area of uh, maximizing revenues from uh, the mining sector, but I think a lot to agree uh, agree on from, from all of you. It's been hugely, hugely informative for all of us uh, to hear the ministers and their experiences and what they're grappling with. And of course, to get the perspective of uh, 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 Professor Ndekumana and yourself, Mr. Butler, on all, on all of these issues. And I hear very, uh, uh, you know, I mean, some differences of views about the potential for the minimum tax, uh, but uh, uh, I think recognition that it can be uh, helpful in, in reducing uh, competition. 
peer learning, I heard uh, Varia said uh, Mr. Butler, and, and the issue of moving away from case by case uh, contra important one and very important area of consensus as well. Uh, capacity development, of course, and the role of the fund uh, in, in supporting that in the areas of its expertise. Uh, and I would only just uh, add to capacity development, uh, there are uh, cases when the skills are developed and not used. And of course, that 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 is uh, something that also needs to be worked on to make sure that when capacity is built in areas of negotiating tax uh, agreements or tax provisions with uh, uh, foreign investors, uh, those people who are trained to really do so are really brought into the negotiation. Sometimes they're not, and uh, sometimes there's uh, 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 not not uh, enough use of uh, those skills. Transparency, as uh, Professor Nikumana spelled out, both on the government side and the side of uh, the private sector uh, in uh, publishing their contracts. Um, uh, good engagement with the uh, with the private sector. <laughs> I mean, to to find areas of common uh, to find common ground in trying to to work uh, on these issues and uh, support for more regional uh, coordination, peer learning, and working uh, jointly on some issues in the in the in the region. So we've we've really run over, and I'm I'm sorry about that, but it's such a, uh, an important conversation and look into how we can do more to. Uh, continue these uh, types of discussions uh, with the with the huge uh, uh, learning that we we get also from it from all of you. So let me thank our honorable ministers for making the time for this, uh, uh, Mr. Butler and Professor Indikumana, all of you for your uh, very valuable contributions. Thank you so very much, and um, thank you I'm sure much. we'll get together again. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci. Bye. Merci, Antoinette. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Antoinette. Thank you, colleagues.